I think one of the most important things that you can be when you're giving advice to, in fact, it is the most important thing that you, that you can do, that you can be when you're giving advice to people with regards to training or modifying existing problematic behavior in their dogs is that you are honest and that what you present is the full facts and that you're truthful in what you say. And I think, um, you know, for something to be untruthful, it doesn't necessarily have to be willfully misleading. So I don't need to tell a deliberate lie, something that I know to be absolutely untrue in order to further my uh, position or to further my ideology or to secure my services with an individual. I don't have to do that. Equally, the omission of something which I know to exist or the omission of something which I know to be true or know to perhaps counter any statement um, that I'm putting forwards, if I willfully omit to mention that, then that's equally dishonest as it is to go out and tell a straight lie. So it's important that I include everything. All right? Everything needs to come in there so that an individual is capable of making their own decision based on the full facts. Equally, to take facts and distort them so that they fit my ideology is also untruthful. It's dishonest to do that, particularly if I know that I'm doing it. And naivety plays a part, plays, plays a large part, because there are a lot of people who think they know everything about everything, but are refusing to look behind certain doors, because they don't want to look behind those doors, because what they think they may find goes against what they want to believe, okay? Cognitive dissonance, if you like. There, there are things that people, I don't want to seek out the things that are going to perhaps disconfirm what I want to believe to be true. So instead, I'm going to cherry pick the areas that do fit my ideology and they're the things that I'm going to present. But what I'm going to say is that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a person that is anti-welfare or that you're a person who is bad in any way, but it does mean that you're a person who's not presenting the whole truth. And when I speak to people, and, and they say to me, if, if somebody decides that they want to go pure reward, that's the way they want to go, then I'll go pure reward with them. I've got no, it doesn't matter. It's not me. It's not my dog. But I will explain the limitations, the benefits of doing so. I will explain where perhaps a correction would be more beneficial. And I'll explain that if you didn't want to use the correction instead, how we might be able to put in uh, the work with positive reinforcement methods to try and match what a correction would achieve. But I will also say that in my experience, it won't, uh, in certain situations, it won't match what correction can achieve because ultimately a correction is what's required or a negative association is what's required. Whether somebody chooses to go ahead and pursue that route is entirely a matter for themselves. I'm not in the habit of convincing anybody that they need to do X, Y, or Z. I will present a balanced argument for X, Y, and Z, suggest which way I would go based on my experiences and what I consider to be in the best interest of the animal in that particular context. And they're all individual. Okay, so the context also including the owner and the lifestyle that they lead, which one is most likely to secure the outcome that they require and desire, uh, while simultaneously having no long-term negative welfare implications on the dog. So that's what I do. But what I won't do is go along and say, look, this is who I am. This is how I train. You know, I completely refuse to look at that or that goes against my personal ethos, my personal bias. So I'm not going to do that. If you want somebody who's going to do that, go and find them. I don't consider that to necessarily be a healthy um, way of interacting with people. I consider it to be best to be able to present people with the whole truth. And I was watching a video last night from a person who no doubt is a lovely guy. I don't doubt that for a second. Um, head screwed on. Welfare of animals is obviously, you know, paramount in this individual's mind. However, I believe that by um, omission, whether that's um, naivety or I don't believe, I, I, to an extent it's willful, to an extent it's intentional, but I don't believe... Um, that that's the, the the major drive behind the guy. I think the guy basically is looking to want to um, perceive something as being more than it is. All right, so that the the power of positive reinforcement as being more than it is. And the upshot of the video that he put out, which is basically a counterattack on somebody that said there are limitations to pos positive reinforcement training. I've done a video. It may have even been mine. I doubt it, but it may have even been my video that he was um, going against because a lot of the stuff that he countered, I've said myself. Um, but I don't know. Said it was overseas, so I don't know. Doesn't really matter. But at the end of it, he said that the the only limitations to positive reinforcement are the limitations within the trainer. 
Okay, so what you basically get is you get an ideology presented and you are then basically saying if this ideology doesn't hold water uh, once applied across the board, then the blame lies with you. So you switch from the actual uh, method, the actual process at hand, and you look instead at the individual and you take the argument onto an individual level, saying that you don't understand enough. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a nasty way, but you don't understand enough, you haven't learned enough, you're not applying it in the right way. Um, do you know what I mean? So we shift away from the actual, well, hang on, is this working? Yes, this will work. This absolutely works. The problem is you. Okay, so bring in another person. Is this working? If you can say, yes, you've now re reached your result, your, your, your desired outcome has been reached with this person and with this person and this person and this person, they've all done it. They've all reached the outcome with that dog for the requirements in that specific context. Then it's fine to point a finger and say, perhaps the problem is with you. But just to generically say positive reinforcement works, the only reason it doesn't work is, or the problems are with the trainer, not the method. There's a problem in stating that unless you've got a huge uh, amount of evidence to support that as being fact. And in this video, what happens is the person is, as I say, countering where somebody else has criticized the um, suggestion that there are no limitations to positive reinforcement training. And one of the things that this person came up with, which I've come up with myself before, is that when you get to off-lead re reliability and the dog sees something that nature throws up that the dog considers to be more appetitive and more rewarding than what you have, positive reinforcement will fail because you're basically trading, right? You're basically saying to the dog, I have this, this is what I have. That's what nature's got, I have this. I've put lots and lots of conditioning into you so you know damn well that I've got this. So even the fact that when I say come, that has the same association for you as the thing that I've got. So this is, this is it. This is as much as I have. There's a squirrel. You know, I've got a working line dog. I've got a dog with a history of prior chasing. There's a squirrel. There's a sheep. There's a cat. There's a deer. There's a whatever, you know, rabbit, bird. It doesn't really matter what it is. But automatically now we're tricky, uh, tripping prey drive. If I cannot match that, which I'm not going to, if it's a really, if it's a decent dog, if it's a dog with any oomph in it, everybody will know this because most people who contact a trainer have gone down this route already and thought they stuff me off. You know, the dog doesn't give a monkeys. When it comes down to it, they don't give a monkeys. And the trainers know this as well, which is why you will get what comes out in this uh, particular answer or this uh, comeback, if you like, to that criticism of a technique is that the dog would be on a long line. So I would prevent the dog from being able to um, rehearse or fulfill those expectancies that it holds, that behavior um, association that it holds. So I see the stimulus, I see the rabbit, I know that I run, running is fun, it releases endorphins, sometimes I might even catch and kill the rabbit, doesn't really matter, it becomes positive in itself. Now the reason that that's positive in itself is because nature pre-equipped me with the ability to be able to perform that behavior, release that behavior in a context where that specific, what you would call a releasing stimuli is present, the rabbit, for example, is present, nature kicks in, what I can pre-equipped with, equipped with is rehearsed, it is made to be positive for me, it is made to carry its own reward, because by virtue of that, I will eat I will live, I will survive, I will go on to reproduce for the next generation and the furtherance of my species. That is why I enjoy what I do. When I look as though I'm playing, chasing something and I'm playing, I may be rehearsing stages of that behavior sequence of that predatory sequence i'm not playing necessarily in the understanding or in the way that humans understand play and if you take any video of a pack of african wild dogs watch them hunt watch the way that they hunt they're not all tearing after it at 300 mile an hour some will trot along some will sit sit back and give themselves a little preen whilst the others are moving then get up and move on and then i'll go in and at some point i may or may not move in for the kill but it's still the predatory sequence is unraveling that's what you're seeing now when i say if i'm to say that, that that is the case and the most effective way when i get to a certain point in my training so i've done all of this i've done all of the long line work i've done all of the positive reinforcement work i've done it i've done it i've done it i've spent all the trials and as this particular person mentions hundreds and hundreds of repetitions of achieving this then the line comes off. And if you don't take the line off, your dog is basically reading that line as being a cue to uh, restraint, okay? Which is why anybody who's working a dog on a recall, those lines need to come off. 
because they'll behave like an angel when the line's on, but once they hear the clip of that G clip come off and off comes the line, they're not stupid. The line is now released. Now you have to have faith in your training or you need a means of being able to stop the dog from carrying out a particular behavior without the dog being aware of the fact that you possess those means. Now, to say, I'm just going to flip over to the notes that I made. I say I made rough notes while I was watching this because I only watched this the once. And what was said was that a long line is used for, uh, and distraction is used to distract the dog back onto you. And a long line is used for prevention. Uh, and then when the dog, uh, and then when the dog comes back to you, we either reward it with the, with the reward that it's become accustomed to, or provided it's um, a fairly innocuous. Uh, trigger releasing stimulus that it that it spotted then I release the dog to go and chase whatever it was that it was chasing so for example if it's a swallow the chances of it catching the swallow are next to nil it's safe for me to allow the dog to run around a cricket pitch for a little while chasing after a swallow as a reward for coming back what's known as a premat principle okay based after us or based upon the name of a scientist who um, stamped his name on the sodding obvious um, and then what you basically get is, is so this is what I've got. I've got that I'm a positive trainer and I'm a positive trainer because I'm choosing not to employ the use of um, an aversive. Instead, I'm using what you would call management through the long line and distraction, right? So these are all terms that you'll hear a lot, you know, interrupt, distract, manage, um, you know, uh, restrain or whatever. Look, when you put a long line on a dog, and the purpose of that long line is so that if that dog runs, I can stop it. I'm applying something, willfully, knowingly applying something, which is going to present something, a sensation for that dog to make the chances of the dog running towards whatever it is it's chasing after less likely. Now, go to any scientific, uh, Google it, do whatever you want. Go to any scientific journal and put in positive punishment. And what you'll basically find is that positive punishment is the introduction or inclusion of something that is considered to be aversive, which basically means that it is something that the dog will work to remove or avoid. Now, it doesn't have to be painful. It just is something that the dog will work to remove or avoid. Believe you me, when a running dog hits the end of a long line, or when a dog is thrashing to pull towards something at the end of a long line that's attached to a flat collar or a harness or anything else, the use of that harness, if the dog then stops pulling and comes back towards me, the use of that long line and flat collar has punished the behavior, at least for that moment in time, of pulling or of running. So if I run and I hit the end of the long line and then I'm called and I come back to you and you're going to say, yay, he's coming back for the reward. No, he's coming back for the fact that I've put a long line on him and he's hit the end of it. So his attempts to chase whatever it is that he's chasing have been blocked or thwarted. He can't do it because of what I've included. And what I've included has stopped the behavior of running forward. It has punished the behavior of moving forward. I have used positive punishment. Okay, and if the dog then susses out, oh, he's got a 30 foot line on here, I'll go within 25 feet and I'll always keep relatively around. Then I've got a dog that's working to avoid the sensation of hitting the end of a long line. I've got a dog that's responding as much on what you'd call negative reinforcement, which is the avoidance or removal of something that I find unpleasant, as I am positive reinforcement, which is the addition of something that I find appetitive or pleasant. Now, this isn't just me saying this. This is part of the whole truth. This is where I'm talking about the facts and the whole truth. If I, uh, let's, let's say that I'm working a dog with food, and I think I've said this before, but just it fits in nicely here. And this is, again, this isn't just me. Look at Church and Campbell's Punishment and Aversive Behaviour volume, if you like. Really <laughs> lovely read. Um, but look in there and look at the effects of negative reinforcement as an aversive okay or non-reward frustrative non-reward as an aversive so basically if i feed a dog and feed a dog and feed a dog like i would do in free shaping because he's getting the behavior right and then i withhold the reward because the dog now i want them to do something more i want them to get a little bit further now the dog is working as much to alleviate the feeling of not getting which is a negative as it is to acquire the positive now there's no 
there's no ifs, buts or maybes about that. That's absolute fact. So to say that I'm a positive reinforcement trainer or I train with pure reward, you're a positive and negative reinforcement trainer at best. And you don't only train with reward, you also train with the non-presentation of reward or the withholding of reward or the delivery of reward contingent upon behaviours that you specify. Okay, so it isn't exactly this um, pure, pure positive reinforcement trainers. They don't exist. It doesn't exist. That's the truth. Just the same as that a pure punishment trainer doesn't exist because you're also working with negative reinforcement and if you want to give the dog some praise then you're also working with positive reinforcement do you know what I mean and if I restrict access to something that the dog wants to get to then by scientific definition of what I'm doing that's negative punishment because I'm taking away something that the dog wants as a, 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 a in the hope of or with the intention of decreasing the behavior that the dog's doing at that moment in time all right so a dog jumps up at a guest guest turns their back on it the, that's negative punishment. I'm taking away the thing that the dog wants, which is interaction. Exactly the same goes for a crate training or for a timeout. I'm talking about crate training if crate training is used as a timeout or putting the dog in another room. It's negative punishment. It isn't all positive reinforcement. And it's important and it's honest that people put this across, that what you term to be... Um, most people view it, if you say punishment, they view it that that involves some sort of physical chastisement of the animal. That isn't what punishment is about. When people, even trainers don't understand this concept, a lot of trainers don't understand this concept, I'm not punishing him. Whatever level of aversive I'm using, if it results in a decrease or a, a, you know, a reduction or a removal of the behaviour that made me do it, that made me introduce that, then I'm punishing. I'm punishing the behavior. I'm doing it through the medium of the dog. Of course I am. The dog is basically my, my conductor for what I, what I introduce. You know, the dog does it, the behavior stops. It has to go through the dog for the behavior to stop. So you'll sometimes say, you don't punish the dog, you punish the behavior, or you don't re reinforce the dog, you reinforce the behavior, reward the dog, whatever. They've got to be together. You know, you're not going to get very far training nothing, whatever method you use. So when you introduce the dog, of course it goes via the dog. I'm just going to come back to what this guy said. Okay, so um, basically I wouldn't use a correction. I wouldn't use a punishment for a dog that fails to recall or decides to chase after something. Instead, I would use a long line and I would use a uh, pre-MAC principle and I would use distraction and I would use uh, positive reinforcement and build up my positive reinforcement. I'd ask questions of this person. First question is, what do you think of instinctive drift? If you don't know what that is, Google it. And you might want to look at the misbehavior of organisms paper from the 1960s in which it was... Um, basically brought to the fore which is the fact that you can train an animal to do anything loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of things and then bang oh christ almighty i'm a dog this is what dogs do never done that before in that context well i'm a dog and i have instincts and there may be times when i drift into what those instincts make me do okay so that isn't mentioned that isn't mentioned anyway i don't know why that isn't mentioned where whether it's a um uh, you know naivety willful or you know i don't know i don't know why that isn't the other thing is, what if you get a dog that isn't food or toy motivated? And don't tell me they don't exist because they do. And if I want a dog that's not food motivated to become food motivated, then the only way that I can achieve that is by putting that dog on a food deprivation protocol, which by itself is aversive, is punitive. So I'm punishing the dog in order to be able to use positive reinforcement, which, to be honest with you, looks ass about face as far as I'm concerned. There are animals that aren't driven by... Um, toys and playing there are animals that don't really give a monkeys whether their owner is alongside them um, certainly particular breeds and there are animals that aren't food motivated certainly when they're out and about which begs the question of how do you then come to use positive reinforcement and what the guy comes on to later on um, because I think somebody says, uh, I can't remember, oh yeah, what do you do if you've got no treats? Do you always have to have treats on you when you're training a dog with positive reinforcement? No, you don't. No, you don't. Not if you're using, well, if you're training with, if you're insistent that you're going to follow one route and that you follow the route that you're going to follow is that I present something that you consider to be uh, appetitive, then yeah, I'm going to have stuff on you because you don't know anything else. You know, the dog or the cue becomes conditioned that, hey, I get reward, I get reward. Well, I'm at least going to have to intermittently or on a random schedule re reinforce that right, with rewards. So, but if I if I don't have, you know, if I have a dog that isn't interested in what I've got, then the argument that came forward, I think, was to use environmental reinforcers. Nothing else came after that. Use environmental reinforcers. As a statement, that sounds very nice. Define it. What is an environmental reinforcer? At the moment in time, the thing that's the most reinforcing for the... And plus, what are you reinforcing? 
So really your term ought to be use environmental rewards to reinforce whatever it is that you want to reinforce. Because let's say that at this moment in time, the most rewarding thing for me is a squirrel at the end of the lane there. How am I going to use that? How am I going to use that squirrel to stop the dog from chasing that squirrel? So the dog goes to chase it, I call the dog back and then I allow the dog to chase the squirrel. That would be your pre-mac answer. Well, all I'm doing is reinforcing chasing the squirrel in one way or another. Do you know what I mean? So this, this term of, well, use environmental reinforcement and then move on to something else. You need to be, if you're going to put that across, it's fine if that's your belief, define it, explain it, go into exactly how that is going to work for dogs with um, an actual, sorry, the thing just popped up, for dogs with, um, you know, a true sort of like prey driving them. Talk about how that's going to work. Don't just make a statement and then move on to something else. Um, the other thing that I was going to talk about is the, the time schedules involved. So you can do it. You can get a dog to respond by using long line training and reward training. And again, by this person's um, own admission, it might take you hundreds of trials or hundreds and hundreds of trials. What for the people that don't have the time for hundreds and hundreds of trials? And then you can say, oh, well, you're lazy and we can come back to pointing at the individual again, you know, the, the highlighting of the human argument rather than the actual process itself. You're lazy, you just need to put in the time it takes, okay? Um, you might start work at nine o'clock in the morning, you might have a five mile trip to work and you might decide to drive. By doing so, you're pumping crap into the environment which is affecting every living organism on the planet. You could walk, you could leave at seven and walk, but you choose not to, you're lazy. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes the most expeditious route doesn't necessarily mean that lazy, it just means that it's the most expeditious route, the most effective route, you know, the most cost effective in terms of so many different things, uh, direct procedure to get from where I am to where I want to be. It doesn't necessarily equate to being lazy. Um, and so uh, equally, you know, I, I don't really want to go into it too much, but the same is true for people who are elderly, impaired uh, due to the onset of certain aspects of um, growing older, you know, where perhaps I don't have it within me to be able to use long lines or to be able to pull dogs back on long lines, particularly if I have larger dogs or people with disabilities or people with, you know, arthritis, you know, injuries, anything like that. Um, it is important that if you're going to put a method forward that you need to be able to mention the cons as well as the pros. It isn't, life isn't just a bed of roses for everything that you choose for it to go down. There are negatives associated with any choice and they need to be put across. It needs to be down to the individual to understand minus the... Okay, my video just cut out. <laughs> I've done so much of this. It basically told me to sod off, so sorry, I had to stop it and restart it. I had to get rid of some stuff off there and restart it. So I'm going to try and cut this down. Um, so uh, let me see. The other thing that, that was argued against was somebody said that positive reinforcement is great for building a behavior. It is, um, but not necessarily for stopping a behavior. Um, and what's what's basically been used by the person who, who put this video together in support of the um idea that there aren't necessarily limitations to positive reinforcement is that um, uh, if you take in for the example aggression all right so someone might need to stop aggression and the argument that's put forward is don't stop it manage it don't stop it manage it so but it doesn't really suggest how if po if the problem lies in the individual and not in the method and somebody says to you okay how can I use that method to stop that and you say don't stop it manage it well, you're immediately admitting by virtue of what you've just said that there's a flaw in the methodology that you're presenting. Um, and it's like anything, you know, kids that are getting bullied and you can either let the bully know that there's a consequence to the actions of bullying or you can just ignore the bullying and hope it goes away and reinforce the bully for doing something positive instead, you know, something other than instead. And I'll tell you for now, you won't stop a bully by doing that. I can tell you from absolute fact, might be anecdotal but I'm sure there's plenty of other people with an anecdotal experience similar to my own. Um, but that's taking a human analogy. It doesn't matter really whether it's a, if we go back to a dog, there are times when positive reinforcement doesn't stop behavior by virtue of what it is. It doesn't stop behavior. It does build behavior. It reinforces behavior. It makes a behavior more likely. So the true answer to positive reinforcement doesn't stop a behavior is no positive reinforcement doesn't stop a behavior. Positive reinforcement might encourage and strengthen an alternative behavior, but no, it doesn't stop a behavior. It does have that fault, which is why you have manage it. That's why the management comes in, which is back to your long line. So I've got a dog on a muzzle and on a lead and I'm walking it by other dogs. And I'm basically going to do my damnedest 
to try and get that dog's focus on me or to try and get a behavior from that dog minus any form of i believe minus any form of correction the dog kicks off towards the other dog and my management is either to reduce distance or increase distance rather take the dog back to a threshold level where it's more comfortable that i can then go into re uh, to reward or to reinforce that behavior at that distance but the fact is by the use of the muzzle by the use of the twin clip lead by whatever it is that I'm putting on once again if the dog kicks off and it is thwarted or prevented from um, getting towards its target which facilitates me to be able to move the dog away I am using the introduction of something that the dog would rather wasn't there I am using an aversive by virtue of the fact that if it would the dog would be were it able to choose the dog would prefer that that wasn't there because by its own behavior it is showing what it chooses to do what it would rather do in that situation so to suggest that i'm doing everything in a positive sense simply is a distortion of what is actually taking place and again it's important that you're honest and that you understand what you are doing if you're then going to go and try and convey that to somebody else um let me see What's the other thing that we've got here? Oh, adding something sufficiently unpleasant is not what modern trainers do because it breaks down relationships through classical conditioning. Now, this is a real sort of like typical staple for um, support of an ideology that lacks actual fact. It lacks actual fact because if you were to basically have a dog that goes over to, I don't know, try and ingest feces and the dog's on a lead and you say, oi, dink, and give it a pull on the lead. Now, if we're gonna say that adding something sufficiently unpleasant is not what modern trainers do because it breaks down relationship through classical conditioning, I've just added something sufficiently unpleasant because the dog isn't going over and ingesting the poo anymore, right? So it's decided not to do that because it just received something sufficiently unpleasant. Theoretically, according to what is being told here, through classical conditioning, the dog should think there's a poo, there's owner, oh, avoid owner because that's it breaking down the relationship. It doesn't happen. It just simply doesn't happen. Can it happen? Yes, of course it can happen. If you use sufficiently intensive, um, aversive presentations by whatever means, certainly physical, certainly something that comes directly from you, and that isn't controllable and isn't predictable as, the fa as far as the dog concerns, is concerned, and it cannot, it cannot switch it off. And it, it, you know, it, it basically has no option but to suffer and endure this onslaught from directly related to the person that it considers to be a trustworthy owner, then of course you are going to get a breakdown in trust. But the fact is, look around you. Go out and look around you and see how often you see that happen. How many dogs you see of the millions and millions of dogs that there are in the world that are owned by people, how many of those dogs where the owners have, um, where they've considered it necessary, corrected a behavior, are you seeing a breakdown in the relationship between the two? And I'll tell you something for an absolute certainty. Again, based on my own experiences and based on YouTube, go on YouTube and have a look and you'll see umpteen examples of this taking place. You'll also see some bad stuff. You will see some bad stuff, but you'll see some good stuff and you'll see examples of what I'm just about to talk to now. So there is no, there is no absolute, every, you know, there isn't a... a you know, a utopia, if you like. There are good and bad to absolutely every aspect. That you know, there's good application and bad application. But you will see trainers with dogs that have received appropriate correction at the appropriate time at the appropriate intensity, um, where the predict predictability of it has been there, and the dog knows that via its own actions it can avoid or control or remove the correction. You know, what you will actually see is an increased bond between the dog and the handler because what the handler comes to be is a uh, a, a, a source of information the, the handler actually says to the dog don't do that because it, yeah you do that well done you know and i can cue you something else instead so it pays me to listen out to the handler why am i going to ignore you you're the person that gives me the information which allows me to accurately predict my environment to the best of my um well-being if you like so I don't buy that. I don't buy the fact that it's it's a nice and it comes across nice, nice slogan. Oh yeah, it will break down the relationship between yourself and not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. Just the same as by um, feeding 
treats to dogs. You know, I could say, oh yeah, if you use rewards and, and you decide to use edible rewards, you get a dog that's jumping up and pulling at your pockets all the time and it won't look at you, it'll look at your pocket or it'll look at the hand where the reward is delivered from. Sometimes yes, sometimes yes. So you can say, is that a good relationship or is the dog actually working for its belly as opposed to the love of its owner? If you were to look at something like Winifred Strickland's point of view, um, and if you don't know Winifred Strickland, Google her, look at the experience of that woman. Um, let me just glance across here. Uh, there's always a risk that this happens. Okay, there's always... Uh, oh, so then he says that truth needs to be based on science. Um, I don't really understand the concept there, because if you're saying that truth needs to be based on science, then positive reinforcement increases behaviours, positive be punishment decreases behaviours. Um, so if for somebody to say, I have a behaviour that I need to stop, I need to decrease, well, the honest answer, if it's truth based on science, would be use positive punishment, because positive punishment is hugely researched and evidence to show that it decreases the frequency of the immediately preceding behaviour. So when we're talking about truth and we're talking about science, it's important that we do project truth and science in what we're saying. Um, dogs that are jumping up, goes on again, use restraints like a lead, use a baby gate, don't allow access to people. Okay, so I'm basically going to remove your access, so it's negative punishment. I'm going to take away the thing that you want. Um, it's not, there's no positive reinforcement in there. Hold the dog back, you know, again. If I'm holding the dog back, it's either negative punishment because that's what it wants to get to, or if it's successful, if the dog pulls forward and hits the end of his lead as he's jumping forward and comes backwards, then the lead has just positively punished the act of jumping forward. Be honest. Be honest in what it is. If you're going to say that it's scientific, then use the whole science. Don't just use the bits that suit your ideology, that suit your personal agenda or your personal preference. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with saying my preference is X. It doesn't mean that this doesn't work. It does work or it can work. Has it got potential negative effects? Yes, it has. How's training with food and training with toys? The same thing happened. It just popped up again to say, but Cameron just said to me, for Christ's sake, Jamie, you're prattling. Get on with it. So I had to delete a few more videos to be able to add this little bit on the end so it's not that I've edited anything it's just the <laughs> cameras just got pissed off with listening to me um so yeah about being honest and and then we come on to the limitations with the trainer let me just see what the last thing um uh and the trainer basically says that I need to come up with uh solutions that don't involve corrections fine if that's your preference that's absolutely fine that doesn't mean that everybody else has to do that it doesn't mean that there's anything uh inherently wrong with choosing an alternative approach to your own and a lot of people will classify themselves as being balanced um, and then attack uh, without any sort of like um, true not understanding but sort of like any true give in somebody else's perspective you know I might attack an ideology where it takes forward and chooses something in isolation and says that this will work in isolation in specific circumstances um, there are certain approaches that will have or yield greater results in a time scale than others, uh, both positive and negative, both reward or reinforcement and punishment or the omission of reward or the introduction of something aversive. There is no, um, there's no need for people to pump this sort of like personal bias, this personal prejudice, and there's certainly no need to present something as being scientific fact if you're going to exclude a large part of scientific fact which also relates to the argument that you're putting forward so it's incredibly important i think what it comes down to what i'm saying here it's got nothing really against the individual who put the video it's just that the video made me think and i thought that this would be worth putting uh, putting some bits and bobs together to hopefully make other people think that what it comes down to is basically um, what is working best in the circumstances, what achieves the greatest result in the circumstances where the welfare of the animal isn't compromised long term. Ideally, the welfare of the animal isn't compromised short term. I just want to quickly, one other thing, um, I don't use corrections, I don't want to use corrections or I try not to use corrections. I would ask, what is wrong? What is wrong with a correction? everybody's gone through life being corrected for something at some point in their life and we're not all quivering wrecks we don't all suffer from learned helplessness or sidman avoidance you know about you know relatively innocuous environmental cues or environmental you know signs that we should or through higher order conditioning consider to be uh, indicative of something negative happening to us that just doesn't occur 
Um, and if correction is used appropriately and used um, with welfare in mind and used at the right time and in the right way, then it actually becomes instructive. It teaches as much as it basically removes, as much as it prevents. And a lot of the time, via removal or via prevention or via suppression, um, the, the use of correction opens up the animal or opens up the, the whole experience that we have before us to facilitate the use of reward. It can, and I've said this before as well, it can be the key that unlocks the door to be able to reward more often, to uh, get a greater result uh, and a greater relationship between your dog and yourself. But it comes, again, it comes down to the individual up here. It comes down to what you've got going up there and what you intend to do with these at the end of your arms or the things at your end of your feet as to how you're going to train your dog. But anybody that's going to choose science or going to choose um, honesty or claim themselves to be in any way morally or ethically superior to somebody else, you need to make sure that you aren't omitting and that you aren't deliberately misleading um, the people where you're putting your points across, where you put it equally that you're not cherry picking, that you're putting the whole science out there to allow people to make their own informed judgments and opinions on the best way forward to achieve their training aims or behavior modification aims with their dogs. Thanks.